ICT literacy and culture and civic literacy. So the scope of literacy is very wide. Now, here is the Matthew effect that the extensive reading has an important role in its literacy development. It seems that self-evident that the amount of reading done will affect performance. The idea that good readers read more, causing them to become even better readers. In contrast, poor readers shy away from reading, which has a negative effect on reading ability. And this caused a gap between good readers and poor readers to improve their literacy skills. In many other fields, we readily accept that practice is important. For example, we know if you want to take part in a marathon race, for example, we need to practice every day. However, when it comes to reading, this message does not seem to get through all our learners and in some cases even to their parents or also the teachers. Reading is the means of is the means to study something, something, wherein the readers look at the words, look at the symbols and the characters of the material so as to comprehend its meaning. And extensive reading as well as intensive reading are the two common approaches to language learning. Therefore, it would help if we could also explain how the volume of reading learners do affect the, the, someone's performance. Helen Scarborough in 2002 argues that there are two components of skilled reading. The first is decoding. When children start learning to read, they identify the individual sounds of the language or the phonemes and then link the sounds to the letter or the alphabet. They have to be able to blend these sounds in order to decode. On its own, of course, this is not reading, but to read with understanding, the child has to know the meaning of word and it has to be in the children's oral vocabulary. Now, this situation leads us to the second component of skilled reading, which is comprehension. In order to comprehend written text, people need to know very well the language in which the text is written. We need a wide vocabulary and a good grasp of its grammar. And we also need to be familiar with the subject matters of the text, or in this case, I would like to say it as a keyword. Comprehension supports decoding. And if we know the meaning of a word and we can understand it in the sentence, then it will ease us to decode the word. Learners who read a lot will get practice uh, they need to achieve fluency. Moreover, there are another or other benefits of re uh, resulting from the extensive reading. Vocabulary itself is one of the key to reading comprehension. And the wider someone's vocabulary knowledge, the better his or her comprehensions will be. However, a wide vocabulary is also a result of extensive reading. Cunningham and, Cunningham and uh, Stanovich in 1998 uh, have shown that written language contains a much richer vocabulary than spoken language. And the amount of reading that children uh, do has a dramatic effect on the number of written words uh, they are exposed to. Literacy in education uh, also refers to getting effective information. For example, by considering the levels of Bloom's taxonomy, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Information literacy involves traditional skills such as reading, researching, and writing. But new ways to read and write have also introduced new skills. Now, keywords. What is keywords? Baker 2004 mentioned that keywords convey essential ideas in a text. Therefore, analyzing the keywords will give a clear view of what the writers intended. A word is a key 
if it occurs in a text or at least as many times as users has specified as a minimum frequency and its frequency in the text when compared with its frequency in the reference corpus in such that the statistical probability as computed by the appropriate procedures. A keyword later on is not based on the concept that's, uh, that are subjectively viewed as important to culture, but allows for any word potential to be key if it occurs frequently enough when compared to a reference corpus. Scott notes that there are three types of keywords, uh, which is often uh, found in the study. The first one is proper nouns. For example, if we uh, read the, the novel Moby Dick, you'll learn that one, yeah? Moby Dick is the name of what, the, the whale? Yeah, by Herman Marville. Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. And then the second one, keywords that human being would recognize as a key and are indicators of the aboutness of a particular text. For example, uh, the novel, The Hobbit, yeah, titled The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Also, Fiesta by Ernest Hemingway. And the third one is high frequency words, which are uh, the most basic and essential words in language that may be indicators of style rather than the aboutness like uh, the second one. For example, like uh, the novel Red by Ted Dacre and the Little House Collections, yeah, uh, part of the Grady Readers, I think. Okay. Then when we talked about frequency, the frequency words refer to the occurrence uh, in language that permeates or affects all aspects of uh, vocabulary behavior. Therefore, frequent words are words that are more, most likely to be met in the discourse. And many researchers argue that language, learn, language learners will learn and acquire more, more frequent words before the less frequent ones. For example, like read in 1998, Simit and Simit, Kaplan in 2001 also said so. And interestingly here, according to ERP or event related potential methodology, that every experience of lexical item leaves a memory trace. Yeah? And for this issue, Laufer and Nation in 1995 classifies vocabulary into four categories. The first 1,000 headwords, or we call it as a K1. The second 1,000, K2, academic words, and all other words that do not belong to the previous group, such as technical words and proper names. Now, the question is, how many words do language learners need to know to be able to read widely? In 2006, again, Prof. Nation comes up with uh, more recent research that estimates uh, people need to know about 6,000 to 7,000 word families in order to be, in order to speak English. And they need, or we need also about 8,000 to 9,000 words to write in the target language. And therefore, Low frequency words should be taught as a vocabulary which is beyond the 8,000 to 9,000 word families. And this knowledge again is needed or is important for wide uh, or extensive reading in English. Come back to the, word, uh, the, the keywords. Many researchers also have used the keyword list in order to gain descriptions accounts of particular genre. For example, like Tribble in 2000, uh, who derives keyword lists uh, from comparing corpus uh, of romantic fiction with a general corpus, and then find evidence to suggest features of spoken language in romantic fiction, yeah? such as first and second person's pronouns, proper, pronoun proper nouns, and fewer complex of noun phrases. Now, how can we know the keywords of reading book. 
keywords are words that far more frequent in our reading text yeah as a proportion of its size than they are in a uh, in a reference corpus simply people uh, can identify it through uh, reading by doing skimming and scanning method as we probably also know However, doing manual text analysis, for example, with around 30,000 words takes more time. Therefore, the study applied corpus method yeah, to conduct this analysis. In corpus, some words are keywords, and keywords are words that are more significant in the corpus, which compared to the reference corpus. Now, keywords show significant lexis in the corpus and it might be analyzed to uncover what topics or issues the writer's concern. So now I would like to show you the analysis later on, yeah, my analysis on the keywords with the two different level of story. The first one is the Lazy Grasshoppers. It's a classic tale level one, a book that I use at home with my son. And the second one is one of the most popular book of the Harry Potter series. Yeah, and thank you for the technology. Also, Tom Cobbs in particular, who has developed an online lexical analysis for a number of vocabulary studies. And to analyze the keywords uh, was conducted by using the keyword feature in the complete uh, lexical tutor or Lex tutor. Yeah. So, keyword, here they are. Okay. The numbers of proceeding of each word in the output here is the number of times more frequent this word in the text than in the corpus BNC and COCA per 10 million words. The 10 million word mixed with spoken US UK was also developed by Paul Nation as the basis for the first 2K on the BNC COCA list that he has. Okay, first let's see the lazy grasshopper. Yeah. The lazy grasshopper here. The first item in the output is 48237.50 grasshoppers. The word is grasshopper, which means that grasshopper has 10 natural occurrence in 10 million words. But from the story, there were 26 occurrence from 539 of the running word text. This would work out uh, to 26 divided to 539 times 10 uh, million, which is equals to 482,375 occurrence if the text were the same size as the corpus. This word does uh, the same as 482,375 per 10, which is equals to 48,237.50 times more frequent in the text than it is in the reference corpus. So probably this means that the word uh, play, uh, this word, uh, the word grasshopper plays an important or the key role in the reading text. Now, the keywords list below contains all the keywords from the text uh, that are at least 25 times more numerous in the text in the reference corpus uh, as the keyness factor. And the greater the keyness factor, the more key a word is likely to be in the input, input text, as you can see here. The first grasshopper, berry, autumn, winter. Now, as I said before, as the keyness cut off 25, there are 13 keywords from total 539 running words for a keyword ratio of 0 0.024. And to promote literacy, people can do a discussions prior the reading activity or after the reading activity. For example, what kinds of discussions we can do in uh, to improve the reader's lexical competence and comprehension skill here? What can we learn from the word grasshopper, for example, as a kind of herbivorous insect that do not undergo complete metamorphosis, for example, 
or the word berry will lead us to think of the kinds of fruits that are juicy, rounded, brightly colored, wheat, sour and tart, and do not have a stone or a pit. Yeah? Even though many pies or seeds may be present such as, as we know, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, what else? Blackberries, red currant, white currant, black currant, and so on. Okay, so that's the first one. Now, this story, I mean, and, uh, about Harry Potter. I think many of you love reading Harry Potters. Yeah? So, uh, in this Harry Potter series, yeah, you learn that uh, Harry Potter series has sold over 500 million copies worldwide, which is made much simpler the fact that the book have been translated into 80 different languages. So this means that a series- Dr. Eka, I am sorry to interrupt. You have five minutes remaining. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. So this means that uh, it is not uh, what you call it, the most uh, read stories in the world, but as, as we are translated, actually, we can see uh, that Harry Potter also what you call it, it's not, once again, it's not the most read stories in the world, but also the most translated as well. And as we learn actually here, yeah, the fact that the first book, yeah, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone uh, produced in with uh, 120 million copies for that thing, yeah. Okay, so now, again, with this Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, the results analysis of the keywords shows that this number, yeah. I think uh, later on again, uh, these kinds of analysis we can do in order to have a look. This is the output, and then we can see also that from the results of the analysis by using uh, uh, Lexutor itself. But what is uh, important here is the keywords also, then, yeah. I mean, the first keyword appears here is the word Potter, and then with the discussions, what we can do is actually we can talk about why do you think Potter, or in this case, Harry Potter is so special? Yeah, and then the second one's lots of things that we can do in order to have looked on these uh, keywords itself. Okay, and then what can we do now? This is the next one, I think the keywords, what can we do to promote literacy through keywords activities? Number one, we can do what's so-called by making words. Yeah, so making words in this case, if we have looked on this, I would like to show you the, oh, okay. I cannot really show you the, the link. Oh, yeah, it's here then. So making words, uh, a spelling-based approach to phonic instructions, for example, like by selecting five to six letters, start with one vowel, guide the students in making one, two, three, four letters word, and so on. And by systematic changing, just one letter. So we can see here that uh, the activity, yeah. So, and then we can try to construct that. And then that's also lead us to know about the keywords itself. Okay, then also we know what's so called by sort and transfer. Again, sort and transfer uh, let us to refocus the students with the words they have and then find the words they made. Yeah, and also transfer, get the students to use what they already learned to do something that, that they haven't taught directly. Yeah, for example, guessing the word, if, if you want to open one word by showing one letter, two letters, parts of this in order to guess the keywords of the, uh, the reading itself. Also word wall activities, word wall activities actually it's a daily activities when we want to edit gradually practice repeatedly until it becomes words and students can read automatically. And keyword decoding, Keyword decoding also the goal. We only word. We only want to see the single keyword representing on, on each of the common spelling word. For example, the word 
uh, IDE, yeah, for example, then what is what kinds of word ended with IDE, IGHD, for example, uh, which is related to the keywords. Uh, actually, from the slides, actually, you can click and then it's connected to the exercise. But because of the limitations of the time, I would like to conclude this, uh, what you call that, presentations. Number one, that being aware with keywords of certain reading is important as they could reveal a great deal about the frequency and facts. And the purpose of teaching working with words are, number one, to help students become strategic in reading words to help students learn high frequency words needed to be fluent, to be successful reading with the comprehensions, and to teach the students the skill required to decode and to spell words they will use for reading and writing. And also to help students to understand how words work. Ability to identify keywords while doing reading will provide the readers better information in related to names, dates, locations, figures, context, and also discourse. And these skills will also be useful for them when they later on, for example, attending English proficiency tests like TOEFL and IELTS. Now, even though it is not a must for teachers, but, uh, but conducting simple supplementary concordance and collocations analysis by using LexCutter, for example, will enable you to obtain a more accurate picture of how keyword function in a text. Thank you very much, Ms. Ades. Thank you so much, Dr. Eka, for sharing. Uh, it's actually um, a very interesting topic since skills to make use of keywords is actually important because uh, it can help students or also researchers to be more aware of you know, the knowledge behind the words and the words in novels or the words in books or songs or because uh and uh, thank you for you know for uh sharing coca and everything because uh, because of you i could actually make use of those sites and and i found corpus is really interesting and also lex tutor too and i actually um so far as teachers we have found that uh making use of keywords are actually beneficial for students too, to, you know, to have deeper analysis on novels uh, and, you know, and other books and songs, and they, it can help them with the research. It can help us actually with the research. And I believe all participants are eager to ask as many questions as possible, but <laughs> unfortunately you have to hold and uh, start taking note of questions because later on after the three keynote speakers have delivered their speeches or have, uh, delivered their presentations, you may ask questions. There will be a question and answer sessions after uh, uh, all of the speakers uh, deliver their speech. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Eka. <laughs> okay, and uh, for the uh, next speaker, I would like to invite Ibu Sofi Dewayani. Ibu Sofi, are you here already? Okay. Okay, I think Ibu Sofi is not in the room yet. Okay. Okay then, uh, while we are waiting for Ibu Sofi to enter the Zoom uh, room, uh, maybe I would like to I would like to invite Dr. Willy Renandia uh, to Perhaps you have you always have new things, sir, for extensive reading, and all of us uh, are always eager to know what's new uh, on extensive reading. Perhaps you could share some of information, sir, about uh, extensive reading and you know how we can make use of it better. Doctor Willy, would you like to share some um, something something new about extensive reading? No, something new or something old or something that, you know, worth sharing. Of course, everything is worth sharing, sir. <laughs> yes, something, something worth sharing about extensive reading uh, in relation to what the uh, speaker just now mentioned is that uh, extensive reading is a great way for improving vocabulary. It's the number one way of improving the uh, depth of vocabulary knowledge. 
I think this is a very important distinction uh, that people need to make. Uh, if you take, if you look at the improvement in terms of the number of words, I think the progress is likely to be rather slow. It takes years and years and years to add new words through, or to learn new words through extensive reading. But what is most important about extensive reading, and this is something that you know a lot of people are not able to appreciate, is the ability, uh, if is is the affordances that extensive reading allow people to acquire vocabulary depth. Now, depth means depth means uh, really understanding what the words mean and really knowing how to use those words for speaking, for writing, for reading, and for listening. In other words, it's the kind of vocabulary knowledge that has a direct influence on your ability to use language for communication. I think that is something that we all need to appreciate. Yes, over the long run, students' vocabulary will increase in terms of the number of words that they know, but on a shorter or mid-term uh, benefit, uh, it would be the student's ability to really know the words very well because words in extensive reading or words in stories are always contextualized. It occurs in context, it explains clearly how the words are used, uh, in what situations with you know, uh, the, the, the purpose for which the word is used, and also the uh, context and also the audience, the people who are using uh, the words in that particular uh, context. And that to me is one of the most powerful impact of extensive reading. So it's not surprising to me that if you have read a lot of books over a short period of time, you get you know, to develop your ability to express yourself uh, more quickly and more easily. I think George Jacobs, my good friend, whom I've been working for the past 30 years, would say the same thing. George, say the same thing, please. If you don't say the same thing, I will unfriend you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I agree completely. First of all, I, I have... I'm on the board of many organizations, but the one I'm proudest of is I'm the international president of the Dr. Willie Renadia fan club. <laughs> so uh, yes, whatever Pac Willie says, I always agree. But the, one of the really great things, maybe the number one great thing about extensive reading is that we're learning, but we're having fun at the same time. Yes. Because there's so many great stories out there. Like I was talking yesterday to Ibu Fenty, and I asked her, how, how did you get to be so good in English? And she said she loves fairy tales. So she used to read lots and lots of fairy tales. Mm. And that's that's what helped her improve her English. And uh, uh, Willie, I know that he's a big he was a big fan of this fictional lawyer named Perry Mason. And yes. he read so many books uh, in that series. So, um, yeah, and I think uh, Pat Echo was talking about the Little Little House on the Prairie series, mm -hmm. another long series. And um, I have to confess that I'm also a fan of Netflix, okay? I know we're not supposed to talk about Netflix, but recently there was a series there based on the Babysitter's Club. And oh, Babysitter's really? Club is a, 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 I don't know how many books there are in that series. Mm. Maybe, maybe up to a hundred, I'm not sure. Mm. So all sorts of great books, fun books to read. So, mm. yeah. So I, I think that I'm going next. Is that right? Yes. Yes, Dr. Jacobs. I was about to tell you that you are going next. Okay. Uh, yes, you will be the second speaker. Thank you, Pat Willie, for sharing. And <laughs> thank you, Dr. Jacobs, for uh, you know being able to move up <laughs> to be the uh, second speaker. Sure. Yes, I'm going to introduce you first, okay. uh, sir. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, Dr. George Jacobs. Uh, 
I could I could get the impression that he's a fun guy reading. <laughs> and Dr. George Jacobs has a PhD in education uh, from University of Hawaii. And for about 30 years, he has taught English for second language students and teachers for plus other teachers in Asia, uh, particularly in Singapore. In Singapore, he taught at RELC with Dr. Willy Renanya. You can see that uh, they have this um, extremely uh, strong bond. Um, and in National Institute of Education and James Cook University. Dr. Jacobs has over 250 publications and he just finished a module on cooperative learning for a MOOC or Massive Open Online Courses that the Extensive Reading Foundation is doing for teachers who want to know more about extensive reading. And in addition to extensive reading, Dr. Jacobs also specializes in cooperative learning, student-centered learning, environmental education, humane education, positive education, and multiple intelligences. Among his publications in these areas are student-centered cooperative learning, simple, powerful strategies for student-centered learning, both with uh, Pak Willy, and teacher source book for extensive reading. Dr. Jacobs is on the boards of the International Ecolinguistic Association, Extensive Reading Foundation, and the Center for a Responsible Future. Dr. George Jacobs, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Bu uh, Desti. Yeah, so I believe that you've got all my slides, right? Or you're going to get them. So no need to worry about writing down what I say. But please take note that of my email address there. So if you have a question that we don't get to today, you can always email me. Below my email address is my website and a lot of my publications are there. They're also on academia.edu and ResearchGate. So I'm very excited about this Indonesia uh, extensive reading association. It's really great to see that, to see all the stuff is happening. Wow, and this is number 11 in the series. So you guys have really been working hard to promote ER. And I know next week, uh, Pak Willie was telling me there's another very good uh, webinar on extensive reading. So I, I definitely want to get the details and attend that one. Okay. So first I'm gonna talk about why cooperation is so powerful in our world. Then why cooperation enhances ER? What is cooperative learning? And just briefly how to add uh, cooperative learning to extensive reading. Okay. Now, like I said, I like to watch Netflix. So I was watching this show called Connected. And every week they, they look at different phenomenon that show the connection between nature, different parts of nature, between humans, etc. So this episode was talking about how a long time ago in Africa, there was a forest but then it dried up and became a desert. But every year, the wind picks up the dust from the desert in Africa and blows it over to the Amazon rainforest. And that provides a lot of nutrition. So everywhere we go, there's these connections and we should acknowledge them and we should try to build harmonious connections. Now, another kind of connection is COVID-19. So we have to help everyone in the world because if even one person or one non-human animal remains with COVID-19, it can spread to the rest of us. So the health of one being is linked to the health of everyone. 
So the idea is that we sink or swim together. Our outcomes are all positively correlated. Thus, by helping others, we help ourselves. It's not a zero-sum game where you win, I lose. Instead, it's win-win. You win, I win too. So we want to spread that philosophy so that everyone wants to help everyone else to become a good reader, a successful language learner. Like I was reading, I do read, okay, I wanna stress that. Uh, I was reading a book earlier this month and according to this book, you know, uh, Homo sapiens, that means us, were not the only species that were similar to humans. There were, one of the others was the Neanderthals. So in the picture on the right is the Neanderthal, on the left is a Homo sapien. So the Neanderthals actually had bigger brains than us. They were a bit bigger physically, but they didn't survive. We're the ones who survived. And one theory, according to this book, which was recommended to me by Ibu Anita Lee from Surabaya, that it's because humans know how to do social learning. We know how to learn from each other. And because of that, we're, we were able to survive. Okay. So next we're gonna look at why cooperation enhances extensive reading, five reasons. Students will be more motivated when they work together. They will be able to get advice on what to read. They'll understand better as like Pak Echo was talking about. They'll have more books and they'll have someone to talk to about the books that they read. So let's look at each of these five reasons. First, motivation. You know, uh, teachers are always complaining, my students aren't, aren't motivated. They're not motivated to learn English. They're not motivated to read. So I, I give them something to read. They come to class. They haven't read it. I remember I was teaching in Honolulu. I was teaching 14-year-old students. I used to start the English class with extensive reading, but I had one student from Vietnam. He just put his head down on the desk. Even when I gave him a book, he didn't want to read. So motivation is so important. So we teachers can motivate students to read by letting them know that we are avid readers ourselves. So uh, Pa Eka can bring his, his um, Harry Potter books to class and talk to his students about how much he loves to read them. But the peers can also motivate each other to read. And peers are more similar in terms of what they like to read in terms of their reading level. So yes, we teachers should continue to motivate students to do the extensive reading, but the peers can probably even do it better. And when fellow students are avid readers, then reading gains a kind of cool factor because you know teachers usually are not that cool. Second, mm -hmm. students can get advice on what to read. There's lots of extensive reading materials out there, hard copy and online. Uh, yesterday, Pa Willie was telling me about, what is it, X? Z, X readers, right, Willie? X reading. X reading. So yeah. you can go online and get those books. Not but, free, though. Not free. But um, maybe the school can, can get them for the students. Or, but there's lots and lots of materials. And I hope that one thing that the Indonesian Extensive Reading Association can do is help in producing more books. Like, one of the previous speakers in this series of talks on extensive reading, uh, Francisca Maria Ivan, she and I did an article about helping students create their own books. 
So you can find that in Tessel EJ, which is a free journal. Okay. In addition to all the books out there, students need to decide which is the right book for them. And students can help each other. They can not only recommend books that they liked, they can also say, uh-uh, maybe this one isn't so good. Just like uh, Ibu Anita recommended the book Humankind to me. I read it. I really liked it. Of course, not all the peers are the same. So they have to learn which peers are going to give them advice that matches their own taste. And also, students can search for books together. Okay, three, comprehension help. Just like teachers can help each uh, can help students when they have comprehension problems, so too can peers. So this can go on informally when students just turn to peers with questions, or it can be structured in a more formal program. For example, older students can assist younger students, or there can be a kind of book club. So students can read the same book and then discuss it. And, and while they're reading, they can help each other with understanding. Four, more books. Students can share the books they own. Like I, I remember reading how Pop Willie bought, he would go to the secondhand shops and buy Perry Mason books. And then he had them at home and then he could share them with, with his friends. Second, students, even older, more proficient students can create simple books for peers to read. So we don't have to buy books, but we can organize, guide our students to create books. So this can be done one book per student, like everyone in the class creates a book or they can work together. And all the electronic tools we have nowadays, it makes book creation easier and a higher quality. Like uh, Pa Willie was telling me how he's experimenting with creating books and using a lot of internet tools to make that better. And last, but I think maybe most important is that peers give us someone to talk to about what we read. So it just makes the whole reading experience more enjoyable when we can talk to somebody about what we read. But, you know, most classes, there's only one teacher. So if we're waiting for, if students have to wait to talk to us, they're gonna wait a long time. But if they're talking to their peers, wow, they've got so many people to talk to, to share their reading experience. What did they like? What was exciting? What character was their favorite? Things like that. Okay, so what is this cooperative learning? Now, cooperative learning has been around at least since the 1960s and things similar to cooperative learning have been around much longer. Uh, one of my favorite websites is this cooperation.org. That's run by maybe the two most famous names in cooperative learning. They're brothers, David and Roger Johnson at the University of Minnesota. So you can go there and they, they don't have a lot of resources, but they definitely have some and what they have are very good quality basic information. Then there's my website already mentioned. And then here's an article that I wrote a long time ago with another former RELC colleague, Patrick Gallo, who now teaches at National University of Singapore. I'm very proud of the title, Reading Alone Together, because that's what it is. You know, extensive reading is silent reading and it's you do it alone, but the together element really enhances extensive reading. A key point here is that cooperative learning is so much more than just a seating arrangement. So the key is not that students are together. Okay, you four are in one group, you four in another group. No, 
that's not what it's about. The key is how the students interact with each other. That's where the skill of teaching via cooperative learning comes in. How do we structure that interaction so everyone gets a chance to talk, everyone needs to think as they talk. They push each other to think more deeply. And some ways to add cooperative learning to extensive reading. Well, there are hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of different cooperative learning techniques. And all of them can be modified. So it's really up to you. There's so much out there on the web, lists of techniques and ideas for applying them. I'm just going to present two. First one is very simple. It's called circle of speakers. And you can do circle of speakers in a group of two, a group of three, a group of four. Please remember two is a group. As a matter of fact, two may be the best size for groups because that's the size where everyone gets to talk a lot. Okay, if you've got if you've got two, potentially everyone can speak half the time. Three, only one third. Four, only one quarter. Okay, now the reason it's called circle of speakers is that they go around. One person talks, the next person, the next person, the next person. So that way, everyone gets a turn. And they take turns for questions. So for example, maybe the question is, what character was most similar to you? So I read one book, uh, Ibu Adesti read another book. So she's gonna first tell me about the character in her book that was most similar to her. Then I'm gonna tell her about the character in the book that I read who was most similar to me. Okay, so we can go around, we can have other questions, we can ask each other to elaborate, lots of possibilities. Then the teacher calls a number, one or two, and the students don't know which number is gonna be called. Then, so let's say the teacher calls number one, uh, Ibu Adesti is number one. So some of the number ones, not all of them, let's say you have, uh, let's say you have 60 students in your class, not 30 number ones, but a few number ones are going to be called. And what they, so what Ibu Adesti does if she's called by the teacher, she doesn't tell the teacher and the class about her character. She tells the teacher and the class about the character that I thought was most similar to me. So this really this really encourages the students to listen. They're not just, it's called circle of speakers, but they're listening too. That way they can report their partner's ideas. So remember, because when I do cooperative learning, I was teaching uh, instructors, Singapore instructors uh, earlier this week. It happens every time. When you call on somebody, after they worked in a group because we were using the breakout rooms in Zoom, right away they tell their idea, their experience. So I've always got to remind them. But it's good for comprehensible input because if uh, Ibu Adesti says something I don't understand, I need to ask her to repeat. I need to ask her to explain, to clarify. And also it helps me to create comprehensible output. So I need to check, did she really understand? Because if she didn't understand, then she won't be able to do a good job of sharing with the class what I said. Okay, now let's do a little bit more complicated technique. This is called circle of interviewers. So for this one, although it certainly can be modified, we're going to have four people in a group. Oh, 
Okay, step one, the group of four is divided into two twosomes. Okay, so let's say we have me and Paul Eka and Ibo Adesti and Paul Willie. Okay, so they're going, so I'm going to interview Pak Eka at the same time uh, Ibu Adesti is interviewing Pak Willie. So, of course, there's a whole, whole host, hundreds of questions we can ask. But one thing the teacher can do is help the students brainstorm questions. Like, did you enjoy the book? Why or why not? Because remember, one of the benefits of cooperative learning with ER is students can recommend good books to each other or tell their peers about books that maybe they won't want to read. Okay, we have some kind of time limit. So let's say I've got three minutes to interview Pakeka, then he has three minutes to interview me. So all the both pairs need to finish in approximately six minutes. Okay, so then what's going to happen is in step four, then we're gonna to come together as a group of four. And Ibu Adesti is gonna tell Pa Eka and me about Pa Willie's book. Pa Willie is gonna tell us about Ibu Adesti's book. Pa Guayan is gonna tell the other pair about my book. Okay, so why do we do this? Because we wanna maximize the peer interactions. Instead of, because like in circle of speakers, remember, the when someone's called on, like Ibu Adesti is called on, she's going to tell the class about my book. So we only have one person talking and 59 people listening. But when we use pairs, we have 30 peer interactions going on. When we use groups of four, we have 15 peer interactions going on. So instead of going from 30 peer interactions to only one, with this circle of interviewers, we go from 30 interactions to 15, which is so much more than one. So in other words, we're maximizing the peer interactions. We're giving a lot more chances for the students to speak, to create the comprehensible output to hear the comp hopefully comprehensible input. So in conclusion, students need time to learn how to do extensive reading and cooperative learning and to want to do it. So it takes a while It's because they have to learn the techniques, but even more, they have to learn how to trust each other. We have to learn how to work together. And of course, with all this, with all the online learning nowadays, there's a whole lot more things to learn. How to use Zoom, all the different features in Zoom. I, like, I was doing a class uh, Thursday. Yeah, so I used whiteboard. You know, there's a whiteboard in Zoom. That was the first time I ever used it. And when the students are in their breakout rooms, they can, they can learn how to use the, uh, they, can screen, they can share screen even in the breakout room. So there's so many different features in Zoom or maybe you use Teams or whatever. And at the same time, we can supplement it with other technology. Like you can use WhatsApp or Telegram to communicate uh, with each other. Or if they're after class, they can use WhatsApp, they can use Gmail, whatever to communicate. So that takes a while. So we should be patient because there's so many people who believe in the zero sum game. And sometimes parents will tell their, their children, don't help others 
that's going to help them, you're going to lose. They're going to do better than you. I don't know about Indonesia, but in Singapore, they have class rank. So if, if I'm number three and Pak Eka is number two and Pak Willie is number one, I don't want to help them because if I help them, they're going to stay one and two and I'm going to stay at three. But if they do badly, ah, that's so good for me. Now I have a chance to move up and become number one. So for so many years, students have heard this and society has taught this. So it takes a while to change from zero sum game to win win. But if we can get it to happen, then just as the dust from tens of thousands of years ago travels from an African desert to nourish the plants in the Amazon rainforest, so too can, stu can your students nourish each other with the joy of reading in any language. So I just want to add one more point because you know, I've given many talks uh, about extensive reading and usually I get questions like this. What if my students don't want to read? What if my school doesn't have the right quantity and quality of books? What if there's not time in my curriculum for ER? Okay. Have you heard all those questions before? Uh, Willie? Yeah, I think so many questions like this. So I'm a big believer in small steps. Like, you know, there's an Irish rock band called U2. They, they came to Singapore, I think, earlier this year. So anyway, they have a song called Song for Someone. Actually, I didn't even know about this song until... Mm, a month or two ago, but I really like this one section. There is a light you cannot always see. In other words, like Pa Willie was saying, it takes a while for the benefits of extensive reading to be seen. We're not going to see them right away. And there is a world we can't always be. So we have this ideal picture. Everyone has their books. They love extensive reading. They, they can't wait to finish one book and start another or to discuss the book that they read. That's the world that we hope will be, but it's not always going to happen. Maybe we want to start every English class with some extensive reading, every Bahasa Indonesia class with some extensive reading, but the principal of our school says cannot, you know, you got to cover all this. You got to prepare the students for the test. Dr. Jacobs, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but your time is up. <laughs> okay, let me just finish the song. All right, okay. <laughs> okay. There is a world we can't always be. There is a dark within and without. In other words, we have all these problems. But there is a light. Don't let it go out. So don't stop promoting extensive reading because it's got so many benefits. Thank you. Can, can you sing the song for us, George? Uh, I can send you the link and you can listen to Bono sing the song. He does a little bit better than me. <laughs> but thanks for the invitation. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. George Jacobs. Uh, it's very uh, interesting information and knowledge for all of us. Uh, so yeah, the teachers and all educators need to set the example of being the avid readers. And then uh, we tend to forget to involve the students in the process of uh, you know, the reading, the choosing, uh, the choosing of books and discussions. And yes, uh, actually what you had just have shared actually is very important because we need to create a sense of belonging to the reading process, in my opinion. And then and it will create a larger community of readers. Uh, and I always uh, believe that a larger community of readers will lead to a larger community of uh, lifelong learners later. Yes. And then 
um, yeah, and uh, I, I even though reading is somehow an individual process, but again, if you know, maximized peer interaction would also help us to understand the world more, in my opinion, because it's not always about the book, but always about the context and society. And yes, sir, in Indonesia, we also have ranks and uh, and this ranking system makes us, you know, uh, have this, I cannot say poor, but it creates such a, um, a sense of competition and somehow it is really unhealthy. Uh, but we have to realize that eventually team success is a personal success. Uh, and then hopefully later on we can create a larger community of leaders. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I just want to pick up on one point that you mentioned about how there's a lot more to a book than just what it says in the book, that in the context there's so much to discuss mm -hmm. and that, that, really, that really makes it exciting and everyone's going to have a different perspective. From because their context is different, so Absolutely. discussions can be very lively. Absolutely, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, for um, those who want to ask questions, you can start typing the questions on the, uh, the chat box, and then later on, we have question and answer sessions later. Uh, and then next, we are going to invite Ibu Sophie. Ibu Sophie, I believe you are here in the Zoom room already. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hello, Ibu. It's really nice. To yeah, see I'm you. so sorry. Yes, it's so okay. sorry. I, yeah, I, I, I was late. Yeah. It's okay. I will introduce you for a bit, Ibu. Okay. Ibu Sophie Devayani, PhD, has served a member of MOAC's National Task Force, Task Force for School Literacy Movement since its foundation in 2015. She is also one of the founders of Litara Foundation, a non-profit organization dedicated to the production of quality children's pictures books and building teachers' capacity in using the books in classroom learning. Litara has collaborated with several organizations in developing quality reading materials. In particular, recently, Litara has also worked with MOEC in developing learning materials for distant learning using storybooks Litara has produced. Ibu Sophie's research is informed by the new literacy studies, a framework that enabled her to delve into the socio-cultural challenges surrounding the implementation of literacy programs in schools. Besides teaching writing at Bandung Institute of Technology, she also writes research articles, monographs, and children's stories. Her research interests children's literacy practices, children's agencies, childhoods, as well as responses towards children. And she's now living in Bandung. Okay, Ibu Sophie, uh, the time is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Everyone, good morning. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to share um, a simple thing that we did recently with the Ministry of Education and Culture um, concerning how to provide um, reading materials, especially uh, for remote areas in Indonesia. So let me share my screen um, with my PowerPoint presentation. Can anyone see? My presentation? Uh, yes, Ibu, we yeah. can. Yes. I'll try to make it full screen. Okay. So, um, as mentioned, I am one of the founders of Litara, and Litara has um, produced like some reading materials for the purpose of in both intensive and extensive reading. And we have also worked with uh, some teachers in some remote areas in. Uh, how to use the materials in their um, classroom learning, especially with literacy learning. And we have also um, helped um, community members in developing or establishing community libraries in, um, in remote areas like in North Kalimantan. So we, we have um, concerns about how the practice of reading have stopped recently 
uh, during this pandemic. So um, that's what we did so far in trying to um, thrive the practice. And we have good opportunities in working with the Ministry of Education and Culture to make this, um, this practice have like wider impact to other nations. So we are grateful for that. And thank you so much for the invitation. I've been listening to the first who talk and have also participated in some sessions. So it's been a, a wonderful opportunity for me to share this. Okay, so I will go through, okay. So if we have um, learned so far, literacy practice is the, the essential, I, I would say it's, a compo uh, it's, it's the essential component or competence in enable a child to thrive during the pandemic because it's the, um, well, let's assume if children do not learn like, um, like uh, what is happening in remote areas um, where we where we heard like a lot of studies stating that um, children experiencing the loss of learning uh, because of the um, uh, because of uh, the absence of schools in their areas and in many areas of uh, children. Oh, Sophie, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. Could you uh, please show the I mean I mean the PowerPoint? Okay. Yes. The full screen? The full screen, yes. Okay, okay, Thank sorry. You. Yeah. Um, some studies have shown that a student experienced what is said as a, a loss of learning in which when they do not meet their teachers face to face, they do not learn at all. And it's said that in some studies that children uh, go back to zero in terms of they, they do not memorize the alphabets anymore and their reading skills have gone back to zero. So, so it's, it's really, worrying. And we can say that literacy is a, an essential skill that keeps children from um, experiencing the, the loss of learning because at least if children read every day, they, they learn to practice with comprehending the text and they also try to um, uh, improve their um, vocabulary um, if they do not learn like um, some materials deeper, for example, in science and social science or in um, physical um, um, activities, at least if they read every day, they can keep their minimum competence um, uh, and, 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 and can use it in their daily life. And we can, and, and we can say that um, when children read a lot, they are also uh, practicing to select information and to use it in problem solving. So it's, 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 it's the common, you know, it's the common knowledge. And it's, it's one thing that the uh, uh, Ministry of Education and Culture also try to promote. This has also become, um, uh, becomes a background uh, why the Ministry of Education recently launched the literacy and numeracy modules. Um, to be made on the basis of the simplifying of the curriculum. So um, the ministry has launched uh, um, some uh, basic competence or competency dasar, yeah? uh, reduced, reduced its numbers and also identify the relevant ones uh, to, to be broken down into operational learning purpose, learning goals, and then uh, use the uh, uh, competency, competency does that into daily uh, learning routines. So basically the modules that have been produced by the ministry comprise of the receptive literacy skills and also productive literacy, skill, literacy skills and also numeracy skills. Both um, skills are to be learned by students uh, both individually or with guidance. So this is what I mentioned uh, previously about the basis for the formulation of the modules. It is based on the um, simplified curriculum. Um, so the reduced number of competency dasar um, selected on the basis of um, um, the selection of the prerequisite competence or prerequisite skills, and then um, mapped out into several 
subjects and then made into uh, simple like operational activities daily. And the models are made into three formats, which is for teachers, for students, and for parents with different purposes, of course. For teachers, this is um, important because I think it's important for teachers to see a concrete examples where they can teach subjects with a reduced loads. Uh, because it's often said uh, by the minister that uh, teachers do not have to, to teach all the, all, all the competence, but teachers do not really see like the example. So I think this model is a good example in which teachers can see how uh, the loads are really reduced. Um, this, is, this is conducted in order to help teacher and focus more on minim, meaningful and foundational lessons because uh, of course they have to consider also the emotional and psychosocial of students um, aspects. And for students, it's also important that they need to learn in an adaptive way with a daily family schedules because the modules also show how the, uh, the, the activities can be divided into three uh, sessions and they can do like, first, for example, first session in the morning and the second one in the afternoon and the, and the third one like um, in the evening, for example, like that. And the modules also provide all reading materials for intensive and extensive reading. So children can read every day. And for parents, of course, the modules will help them to uh, to guide uh, students in, the, in their uh, the, uh, daily learning activities at home. So why is it important in the context of Indonesia that, we, uh, that the government uh, do not only say that, okay, you have to think of a way um, to, um, to use your uh, financial resources in the format of Dana Boss to, uh, to add your collection of books, for example, or um, for the government to say, okay, teachers, you don't force your students to, uh, to fulfill all the competence. Teachers really need to see like the concrete examples and it can be done through the mediation of uh, the use of the teaching toolkits that facilitate uh, student, parents and uh, teachers interactions in a, in, in, in a very prescriptive manner because um, for teachers in urban areas, they can they can, uh, they can identify the important aspects of the curriculum independently, but teachers in the remote areas, really they are struggling with how to formulate the curriculum in a way that, it, that is adaptive for students. So I think um, we need a, a module that gives this example. So in this way, the module provide um, a way to facilitate teachers and parents meeting, for example. So in the module for teachers, for example, um, it is written like how, like um, how you should um, uh, interact with parents, like what things you should emphasize with parents, like um, teaching tips or learning tips or something like that. And also the example of adaptable level to accommodate teach students different needs and competence. And also, of course, like I said previously, the modules also provide all reading materials to use for extensive and intensive reading activities. So for example, in a week, students are provided with three reading material, which are level with uh, follow-up activities. So I will, I will show you some examples. So these are the contents for a module for teachers, for parents, and for students. So in the teacher module, for example, uh, the teachers are provided with the guidelines to assist parents with impl uh, in implementing the activities with students, sharing learning tips and strategies, and also how to adjust activities with home routines and students' competence, and also, of course, the assessment and the rubric. And also for parents, the module provides guidelines to um, implement the activities with students, also learning tips, and also making the schedule um, according to the home routine activities. And also for students, the, the modules provide uh, reading materials, daily activities with, pro, with pre and post reading activities, and also question prompts for writing, and also worksheet samples with relevant graphic organizer, and also post learning self uh, reflexive questions, and also the guidance for the weekly family projects. Um, 
providing like a flexible uh, way as possible. For example, like the module say, like if you if 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 you do not have the the materials and the tools available, you can just uh, replace the, the project with something that is similar, because uh, we have to remember that this is for very remote areas in which um, students live in different in different conditions. For example, with the with their um, diverse like poverty levels and parents' competence. So we have to provide like as many as um, alternatives as possible. And also reading journals, also uh, uh, something that students have to fill in uh, daily. So these are examples of activities, literacy activities for early grades students and higher grade students. Um, there is this repetitive like activities uh, repeated with, with a simple pattern that enable uh, parents and students to, for example, to familiarize themselves with the routines. For example, every morning you start with a morning message in which students uh, reply to teachers' questions. And for students for early grades, they reply the questions read by the parents or any adults that accompany them at home. And for the higher grades, uh, students, they, they can write their, their replies independently. So this works um, as a um, kegiatan apersepsi yeah, or introduction activity for children to get uh, students uh, to the topic discussed in that way. So it's like an orientation activity. And then um, after that, you have interactive read aloud in which students read to the stories read by the parents or any adults at home or their caregiver. And for older uh, students, they can read um, to a text. They, they can read a text. It can be an informational text or a fictional text. And they uh, have to reply uh, to some questions. And also, there are uh, guided reading activities, uh, thematic writing. And also, for early grade uh, students, they have to memorize sight words my five words this week and also they have independent reading and then fill it the reading journal and also my reflection daily uh, students have um, 90 minutes of literacy activity for early grades and also 105 minutes for uh, higher grades in literacy activities and they have another uh, 90 and minutes of numeracy activities for early grade students and also 105 minutes of numerous activities for higher grade students. So it's not many actually. Um, for example, a lot of teachers in urban setting consider this like too simple, but um, from a few feedback that we obtain, uh, students in remote areas can do this just, um, just fine, yeah. Okay, so this is an example of student module. Every day you, you start the activities with applying to student uh, to teachers a question. This is an example of um, types of teachers question in the morning message, like what today is, what day, what day is it today? Like what date is it today? And then students have to fill in the date and uh, the name of the day. And then uh, who are the member of your family? How many people in your family like that? So this is a bit different from uh, the textbook, the school textbook that the teachers are currently using. And then um, students are also asked to uh, make inferences toward um, the story that they will uh, that that will uh, be read by by the parents. This is for the early grade students, and this is for higher grade students. Uh, the same like type of uh, questions. Um, except that it's more advanced. For example, like students have to write down their address, like the name of the street, um, kelurahan, kecamatan, or city, like that. And then also have to make inferences toward the, uh, the cover uh, of the book that they will read. Okay, and this is, um, this is the example of the reading material. And these are the questions um, for responding to the to the reading. Like that. This is the question for responding to the reading. Students have to write down the title of the story. And then students have to also differentiate which is 
the opinion that is made by the character in the story. This is the second activity for the early grade. This is just an example for thematic writing. They have to write down or to, to draw the member of their family. And then uh, this is the side work. Uh, because this is a set for the first week, they have to memorize the alphabet first. For higher grade, they, they have to write what the character of the story did in the story and then what comes next and then how is the ending of the story like that. And also this is the word study or word work in which they learn to reuse the new word that they gain from the story in new sentences. And then also the module also fostered interaction with families in which students are asked to, uh, to retell the story in their own language. For example, um, uh, this is asked about the specific part in the story that is interesting and then ask the students to retell the story uh, to the family members. And then the parents or, or the caregivers can uh, add their signature in that, uh, in that worksheet. This is a sample of the word work. Um, students have to make new sentences using the new word. For example, here is the uh, sport facilities and also educational facilities and also housing. And the weekly family project is conducted on uh, the, the day six um, of each week. So um, for example, every day students get reminder that uh, by the end of the week, you will do like cooking project with your family. So remember to talk with your uh, family about like what, what kind of meal that you will cook together. And then on the second day, the students also are asked about like, uh, have you talked about the ingredients for that meal, for example, like that. So reminding uh, students every day because a family project is something that usually is prepared and parents wouldn't like if if they get a short notice about it. So, so we also consider that. Okay, so this is reflection for higher grades. The same is also uh, done by the early grade student. Okay, so this is for the extensive reading. So the, every week they have like one reading material uh, according to that level um, for the extensive reading. So for this activity, they, uh, they, they just have to write down the the information of the time they read it and also the title of the book that they read. This is an example of a reading material um, obtained from the uh, Badan Bahasa. This is made by Badan Bahasa. Okay, so this shows the adaptability of the activities. For example, students and parents can break down the activities into three uh, parts. Uh, they can do activity one in the morning which comprise of morning message, interactive reading for early grades and word study and reading journal, filling in the reading journal and for higher grades, uh, children can do, can do this activity. On for, for the second activity is usually the thematic writing and also tell the writing uh, to the family members. And the third activity is usually an activity children can do like after taking a nap or after like helping parents like working in the field or in the, in the garden or in the market. And they can do this in the evening. And this is the activity. And this is the example of model of the teachers. It shows teachers like the theme and the sub theme and the topic and the, and the question prompt and the new vocabulary and also um, the time allocation and also the learning goal for that um, week and also the, uh, the title of the project. And also it's provided in the teacher module, the answer key and the assessment rubric. And, it, and, 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 we, and we think it's important because in Indonesia, teachers tend to ask students to, to answer a question just as it is, how it is written in the answer key. So we need to show like the range of the answer possibility uh, so that teachers um, can also consider like a lot of ways that teacher that, that a student can answer and then can um, evaluate that um, accordingly. And this is model for parent. It's just like a very brief 
is just uh, show the scope and sequence of the activity of the week. This. And also we, we um, the Ministry of Education and Culture also realizes that a lot of parents in remote areas are illiterate. So there will be a problem in asking uh, parents to help um, students in learning at home because sometimes they have to go to the field, to the garden, and to the market, and they do not have time to help their children. So um, uh, currently, um, the universities also conduct um, with the coordination of the uh, Higher Education Directorate in the Ministry of Education. They also conduct a program called uh, Campus Mengajar or Teaching Campus, which is a kind of like a student volunteerism program and um, ask students to especially teach this model, this literacy and numeracy models to the, the students in their neighborhood or in their, in, in their cities, because it's not also possible to ask students to travel that far to remote areas. So um, the program was launched last week and uh, students uh, who will teach also get um, the training about the, the content of this module, like for example, how to assist teachers, how to help teacher like conduct like a diagnostic assessment to identify student competence and need, and how to help teacher organize meeting, how to help teachers comprehend, how to help teachers obtain. Uh, of course, there are a lot of questions from students, for example, like, like what if uh, teachers like insist on like using other models, like uh, in, a, in a complete like scenario and, and we give some advices to students. And of course, like um, in, some, in, in some settings, students also might work with parents directly. And we also give them tips on how to work with parents. And also in a situation in which they have to assist the students directly, we also give them tips of how to, in what areas students can, can help, like in, in improving students' competence. So, so um, these modules um, need like contribution and participation from a lot of parties. So um, because um, especially if we talk about remote areas, like we talk about limited resources um, and we also work with some CSOs, for example, some, some CSOs are willing to train teachers to adapt and to modify these modules uh, because for some areas, uh, teachers still think that these modules are still dif too difficult for the students. So, of course, in that situation, they they can they can they can adapt and modify the content of these modules. For example, like reducing the number of questions, like uh, searching like other uh, reading materials uh, which are easier, things like that. So, there are some attempts to socialize this module uh, for teachers in remote areas. Okay, I'd like to quote what uh, our like um, um, Ki Hajar Dewantara ya, um, that said that uh, make every place a school and make everyone a teacher. I think that's like a very relevant quote to to remember in this time of pandemic, in which um, education is the responsibility of everyone, and every place is a place to learn. So I think I. I would like to close my uh, presentation with that, Ibu Adesti. Thank you so much for the, uh, the opportunity. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much for sharing, Ibu Sofi. What a very interesting uh, knowledge and information for all of us. Uh, that it is always good to know that actually government is trying to develop a modules and material that is uh, tailored and adaptable. And it, it enhances uh, self-regulated learning and learning autonomy. And of course, I also believe that the government uh, supports us to have a more different more uh, to to apply more different differentiated instructions uh especially during the this uh time this uh, hard time for all of us and also i i love the i love the idea of involving parents in the process because i believe that in education uh, uh teachers students and parents have to like create a very good and synergy uh to make the learning better and yes but but during the pandemic, I see some of the comments in the chat box and uh, 
like um, based on the observation, it's parents who will work harder during this pandemic, not the students. So you can imagine that if a person is a teacher and also a parent, <laughs> so they have, you know, uh, maybe they have overwhelming job, but uh, it's the way, that's the way it is now. And yes, uh, there are a lot of questions here already. So uh, I'm going to uh, read one by one and um, and as, hopefully all of those questions can be answered in these questions and answer sessions. Okay, I will start uh, reading from uh, Sean, Sean Patrick. Hello. Okay, uh, this question is addressed to Dr. Eka. Um, in implementing ER through Harry Potter, which is from the British English version, uh, I'm wondering how do you solve some confusion for students to differentiate or dissect between English UK or US uh, for beginners in the long run? Uh, so what version of English in the literary piece that we should focus on? Would it be better to possess students with world English literature so they can have more lexical expansion from Aussie English Canadians or even the pigeons or creoles in light of keywords that are helpful for students vocabulary acquisition and their heuristics because of because mostly of US English is mostly used in the daily life. Okay, that's the questions for you, uh, Dr. Eka. Okay, um, hopefully you all again, hopefully all questions can be answered in this question. Please, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Sean, hi Sean, I am, I really appreciate your questions and I could also see that uh, what your positive involvement in every series of ER and I think this is, this is something good, yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, to answer your questions, I also relate to what Willie really just mentions about the uh, depth of vocabulary knowledge. So and, uh, ER extensively then supports depth of vocabulary knowledge. Uh, I mentioned before about the uh, breath, it's about the number of words that people need to know. But what is that in this case? So that's actually later on to answer your uh, questions, whether it's in UK or US. As you learn also probably from uh, Nation's book in 2001, page 1347, knowing a word is not enough on knowing the meaning of the word, but actually there are three important aspect yeah the first is the form second is the meaning and the third is the use so form related to the spoken written and word parts so what does the word sounds like how does how is the word pronounced what does the word look like and so on so parts of that's all the the form and and knowing a word we need also to identify that so for example if you want to know the one in English, uh, British English, then you have to also understand the, the form, what is written down in uh, British English and, uh, as well as in US. I don't want to say which one is which, both is okay as a learner, I mean that we are using English as a second or a foreign language. In this case, it's, it's very important for us to know all of them. Also the meaning, yeah? Form and meaning is in, interconnected, the concept and reference also. The associations, yeah? And finally, the use. What is the grammatical functions? What is the collocations of using the words? And probably there are some constraints. There's a register, yeah? polite, impolite, frequency, and so on, uh, being uh, considerations. What can we do for that then? This is the explanations that I don't really have, uh, what you call it, explained before. But I would like to share a little bit on the sort and transfer that we can do actually for the lower level. Uh, allow me to share that a little bit, the screen. So here, for example, sort and sorting and transferring. So we try to, with the keywords before, we would like to refocus the students on the words they already made. And then later on, we try to find all the words they made by, for example, seeing which one is this, uh, has the same beginning sounds, have the same letter, numbers of letters share the spelling pattern. I think that kinds of activity can we do in order to accommodate for the lower level or the young, younger learners, yeah? Also transfer, yeah? Get the students to use what they have learned to do something they, have, uh, they haven't taught directly, for example. So then again, 
this will accommodate what I just mentioned before. It's the second one is uh, about meaning focus learning. We pay attention on the deliberate process. We pay attention on how the word is being constructed. We pay attention to how the certain word is being pronounced and then it will lead us to uh, a certain, what you call that, like a notion, which is not merely on the meaning itself, example uh, from the dictionary. I think that's all, uh, Miss Alessi, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry because we do not have um, more time, I guess. I think all questions on the chat box will be answered by uh, the speakers, if you don't mind. So each speaker will type uh, their answers in the chat box according to the questions. And also in, on YouTube as well. The, they will uh, later, uh, we will send the questions and they will chat. They will chat. Uh, they will send the answer and we will uh, again type the answer on the uh, on the YouTube chat box. Okay, let's go to the next um, session. We are going to have two panelists here. Um, I'm going to invite Ibu Arum. Uh, Ibu Arum, are you here Ibu Arum? Can you show yes. your face? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, I will introduce you shortly Ibu. Okay. Uh, okay. Ibu Arum is an avid reader, teacher and a daughter. He love, her love for books has started since she was able to read. Amazing. She started her career at Sekolah Kembang in August 2008. She had been teaching elementary level from second until sixth grade. Her main interest, uh, interests are language and classroom reading activities. She's also a fond of children literature as sometimes she brings her book collection to be enjoyed together with the students. And since 2016, she led the Department of Literacy at Sekolah Kembang. She's responsible for developing the library programs and book curating. She believes that every book is worth to read as each book has its own value and message. And Ms. Arum holds a bachelor degree in psychology from Universitas Indonesia in 2004. And she also joined teacher education program at Sampurna School of Education in 2010. Ms. Arum, the time is yours. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ades. You're welcome. Okay, I'll start uh, share my presentation. Okay, uh, is it clear? Yes, it is. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's always uh, uh, nice to be back again uh, participating in Sampurna University's event. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my uh, our experience at Sekolah Kembang in practicing extensive reading. My name is Sekarayu Adaningrum. Uh, in short, uh, people call me Arum. Now I'm a head of library and literacy department at Sekolah Kembang. Okay, uh, I'm going to start. Uh, sorry. Okay, uh, I'm going to start with uh, how literature-based uh, activity uh, is being done at Sekolah Kembang. Uh, first, uh, the teachers at Sekolah Kembang from kinder, uh, from playgroup, kindergarten, and primary grade uh, use the children literature as a, as a base uh, reference to develop uh, the learning theme or unit. So. Um, the teacher also expanding the, the content of the or the story of the book uh, into uh, not only for, to teach reading or language, but also to teach uh, pre-math, pre-reading uh, skills, uh, pre-writing, arts and craft, science, uh, physical activities, PE, or in a, a higher level, uh, science, social, uh, social, um, education, uh, citizenship, and, and so on. And uh, for moving into the higher level uh, in primary, grade three until six, uh, they, they read a more comprehensive uh, books or texts. So they read novel, uh, they, they will read one novel per quarter. So in one year, uh, students uh, have already read minimum for, for novels. And next is um, differentiated. 
at Sekolah Kembang we make our own worksheets, our own uh, learning learning activities. So teacher develop various and customized activities to cater the students' needs. Um, uh, so for example, um, if we are using the same books or the same references as uh, last year's uh, class, uh, the activity will, will be different because uh, we are teaching a different group of students, different characteristics, different uh, learning level, different interests, different anything. So we cannot just uh, use it as, as it is, just copy and, and uh, use the same materials uh, like the previous year. So we make it uh, customized uh, and try to um, cater uh, each student's needs. And last but not least, discussion. Discussion activity plays a key role in not only in reading or language activities, but in every learning process at Sekolah Kembang from uh, preschool, uh, from kindergarten, playgroup to uh, primary. And the discussion took place uh, at uh, and in relation to reading activities, uh, the discussion took place uh, before reading. Uh, for example, we try to uh, discuss the illustration, the book cover, the author maybe, or the synopsis uh, at the uh, back of the book. And then maybe we ask the students, what do you think the story about? What do you think about the, the illustration and so on? And moving on to reading. Uh, so during reading, we we mostly uh, talk about the story or the character, or maybe the students wants to ask question about uh, the vocabulary or, or something they, they didn't understand. Or maybe uh, the teacher finds a, a good, uh, an interesting point of view uh, from the story. So they will stop at, in the middle of, of reading and try to make a conversation or make a discussion uh, to the students. And after reading, we also uh, discuss about what do you, uh, what do the students think about the story. Do you like it? Uh, is it is it match your prediction before? Do you, what do you think about the character and and so on? Okay, uh, moving on. Um, how teachers can conduct a literature based activity? Uh, teacher plays a very important part so teachers should be a role model uh, in reading teacher uh, students must be able to see and feel that their teacher is also a reader um, uh, teacher has to have to set an, a good example in reading start from how to take care of book how to use books how to uh, uh, perceive information from from the book how to tell stories how to answer question how to ask question anything so that uh, students feel um, maybe yeah, okay uh, my my teacher is also a reader so I will try to to be a reader too okay and the second uh, uh, part is in order to be a good role model, a teacher should also understand a broad concept of literacy. Literacy is not only books, not only reading and writing, but way more than that. In uh, literacy is uh, how we can understand or use the information that we read, we see, we heard, we uh, anything we smell maybe in our life in order to make a decision. In, in our life, what, what to do with that information. So in order to do that, uh, more active methods should be done uh, in order to improve those literacy skills. Uh, by doing what? Uh, give, the, uh, give them time to do presentation, um, working in groups, um, question and answer discussion again, once more. Um, uh, allow them to ask questions, uh, help them to express their ideas, uh, giving them time to practice their uh, speaking skills, their listening skills, and so on. So uh, another part is classroom autonomy. Uh, at Sekolah Kembang, um, classroom teachers have the full autonomy in managing their classes. Uh, starting from uh, the physical aspects such as the decoration or the designs or the classroom settings to the 
uh, learning process and activities or such as what kind of values that they want to set in, in the classroom, what, what are the vision and, and missions uh, they wanted in, in the class, how will they do that, how will they talk to the students, uh, what kind of classroom uh, rules that wants to be set, uh, uh, things like that. So a uh, uh, whole whole process, a uh, thorough process, starting from the beginning of the uh, class starts until the the end. So um, I think uh, if the if the students are already being a good role model, understand the broad concept of literacy, so he or she can uh, have a enough enough knowledge or standpoints on what to what what to be set in in their classroom Ibu Arum, um, i'm sorry to interrupt you have two minutes remaining okay okay, okay. Thank you. and next one is mastering the questioning techniques in order to build a strong uh edu uh uh, sorry, discussing uh, discussion moment, you have teacher have to ask able to ask the right question. And last but not least, teacher supports teacher. Uh, we are there for for each other. We are uh, have the scheduled meeting to sh for sharing and supporting each other, uh, giving advice, um, asking question, answering questions, and so on. Okay, uh, next, here are the example of intensive reading in grade three to six. Now they are reading four novels, uh, grade three, Nawila, grade four, Nawila dan Rumah Dalam Gang, grade six, uh, Anak, Anak Rantau by Anwar Fuadi, uh, sorry, grade five, and grade six is uh, reading Hatta. Okay, extensive reading at Sekolah Kembang, uh, there are three um, major forms. First is classroom library. We have various book selection in each class and one to two ratio. So every student must be able to read at least they have uh, one or two books when it's time to uh, use the uh, classroom library. Students can choose the book along with the teachers. Uh, so we will be divided uh, the first half, the 20. Uh, so in order, let's say we have 20 students at the one classroom, so the amount of books should be minimum at 40 or 42 uh, books. So uh, teachers can choose uh, the first 20 books and the rest uh, is chosen by the students. And book rotation every one, every two months depends on the, on the needs. Next one, we have drop everything and read. Um, this is uh, done once a week, uh, 20 to 30 minutes. This is like more fluid reading and uh, reading activities. Uh, teach, uh, students can choose whatever they want to read, uh, with who, teach reading in groups, listen to the teacher reads to them. But the teacher also have to uh, make 100% involvement in accompanying the students to observe, to be with their students, to know what the students uh, interest. Uh, maybe they have difficulties and so on. And the last one is library visit. Um, the school library, of course, have um, a wider book selection. They each class have a once a week schedule, every, uh, and each schedule is forty minutes. This is also free reading and free browsing. Uh, teachers and librarian are also there to help the students make a decision on what books they want to read or they want to borrow. Uh, at, uh, and bring it uh, to, to their home. Okay, Miss Arum, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. the time is up. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you, Bu Ades. Thank you so much, Miss Arum. Uh, I'm sorry to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to inform that actually each panelist has 10 minutes, but okay. you uh, did that very uh, uh, well. Yeah, okay, and I will, yes, thank you so much. And I will invite the next um, panelist. Uh, Miss Rizky Amalia Witri, are you here, there? Miss Rizky Amalia Vitri. Hello. Yes, Miss, I'm here. Yes. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi. Okay. Show your face, please. Uh, I have turned on my okay, good. camera. Actually, can you okay. see me uh, and I'm, hear me? Yeah, I'm going to uh, introduce you shortly. Okay. Uh, Miss Mamal. Miss Mamal uh, is yeah. a teacher and a book, book club facilitator at the Children Learning Center and Library at the Learning Castle. She graduated from Sampurna University with bachelor degree in English language teaching. She devotes her leisure time to crafty stories, films, books, and plays, which she loves pouring her thoughts about. 
And even though she was my student, Miss Momoli and I actually have become good friends, right? <laughs> Yeah, we are. Yes. <laughs> and uh, she also has an IG uh, Instagram account called Cinematic Journal and a YouTube channel called Being Mamal to be the platform of her brilliant creativity. Oh. <laughs> okay. Miss Mamal, the time is yours. Thank you so much, Miss Ades, for a very nice introduction. It sounds better coming from you. Uh, so hello, everyone. First of all, it has been uh, a great two hours. I have uh, been inspired by you. Like I have, I have learned a lot from uh, the other panelists and speakers. So thank you so much, uh, Sampona University and IRA for this opportunity. So yeah, my name is Rizky Amalia Witri. Uh, most people call me Mama. So that I think that comes from the Amalia sound. So it's Amalia. So yeah, I'm a teacher, I'm a book club facilitator and I, I'm a preschool teacher too. And I love um, spending my time, especially lately uh, to write, to write and blog about uh, uh, about films and cinema, uh, um, crafty entertainments are like uh, uh, other uh, like plays to books, and also uh, music. Most most of the times are those things, but I basically love pouring what's on my chest and what's on my mind, or like on anything, so I can get moved by the food, the food I eat, and then later on I reflect back on a written form, something like that. So I find that idea therapeutic, and I am so glad that Bapa uh, Eka mentioned about the keyword the, the use of the the use of utilizing the keywords and also like the reading alone but together and then circle of speaking and also like ibu sophie mentioned about uh, various possibility of answers from the students and uh, ibu arum about conducting literature based uh, activities so when i kind of like realize that we are actually doing all of that so it is uh it feels like a confirmation that what, I've, what we've been doing are not off the track so yeah thank you so much for that so well i would like to share uh what i have prepared i'll do something here uh, okay so this is more of an experience sharing uh yeah this is what i do and this is what i love doing um and I would like to start from it started. So comic books and films were two essential parts of me, uh, of my journey to literacy. So it started off uh, from reading a lot of comic books and other uh, reading materials. As a kid, I loved reading Richie Rich, Donald Duck's Cannons, and Goosebumps, right? Have you uh, read or probably like, do you have any piece of this? Uh, yeah. In my opinion, they are timeless. So, and I came to know that all of the things that I loved reading at that time were adapted into films or TV series. Like uh, I came across to Goosebumps TV series at that, at that time and I knew about Richie Rich films. And, uh, and by the way, all of these things at that time when I was a kid were in Bahasa Indonesia because at that time, I, my English was still, uh, I mean, English was just another alien language for me at the time. So yeah. I couldn't even introduce myself properly. So, and this, when I came uh, to know about this knowledge that that's how my interest in films started. So it hit me quite hard because I suddenly was a movie buff. Is that the term you're using, movie mania? But I cannot really say that I was a movie goer because I didn't really go to movie cinemas because in Subang, we don't have it. We, we didn't and we still don't, but I did watch a lot of films and I did read a lot of books too. And uh, the on uh, I I I what is that? Uh, uh, I get the access to the films that I love watching at the time is from the local DVD rental. So at least after school, I would bring one piece to be brought home, and then I watched it as many times as I could before returning it. So this was probably my source of happiness at that time when I was growing up, and we don't have it anymore now. Uh, <laughs> And then I had this life goal at that time. My dream was to be able to watch English language films without having to read the subtitle. So I was imagining myself sitting on a couch, just focus on a picture, on the films without having to read the text below there. So, and then I found uh, this meme, which I found really relatable and funny that I didn't want to keep doing this, that I know I, I didn't want to, uh, because I couldn't multitask, I guess at that time. So I cannot, I couldn't really focus on you know the 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 film as well as at the same time that uh, reading the subtitles as well. So uh, from there, I realized that to be able to watch the films or even read the book that I love reading in English uh, is by learning the language. So I really was driven to 
learn that. Um, I that's how the alteration happened. So because I realized that English was very important at that time, I was really determined to 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 access that. So from the readings from the comic books that was before in Bahasa Indonesia, then I tried to find the English versions of that, and then. I uh, started to read uh, because I was a preteen at that time. As a preteen, I loved reading magazines, and How Anku was my favorite at that time. But then I realized that if I kept on reading How Anku, then you know uh, that's that doesn't really help my English at that time. So uh, I came across to Cinemax. My friend in, uh, introduced me at that time, and it was like a gold mine for me because not only it is full of movie updates and movie information, right, film reviews and everything, but it is also written in English. I love reading those movie review section without understanding how probably 90% of it, but I still love reading it. I, I uh, my Cinemax at that time probably were full of marks and highlights. That's me marking the words that I didn't understand. And I would look it up and yeah, it was always like um, <laughs> satisfying for me to finally found the meaning of it. And another big, yeah, I have everyone heard the name called Warnet. <laughs> so I went to this place uh, quite a lot, almost every day at that time. So for you who haven't heard the term Warnet, is Warnet is basically the short for Warung Internet. So it's like uh, internet cafe, and I. I went there uh, for my assignments most of the time, but I used the extra time to access YouTube. I watched a lot of interviews, movie clips on YouTube, like anything that I could find. And I really loved imitating the people uh, who are speaking there, uh, and the stars or, or, or the, the, the celebs or, or, or the news. I just, I love picking up some uh, the, the, the aspects from their accents and everything. And I would imitate, imitate them in my daily basis in front of, near and so yeah and then another big thing another uh big part of me uh coming across to to literacy is that disney show disney shows influence at that time the shows uh such as jonas Hannah montana and wizard of Beverly place were big when i was growing up so i literally grew up with them and i didn't even have the channel i yeah ma uh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt yes. we have three minutes remaining and are okay. you actually sharing the screen because we haven't seen the screens yet oh i haven't really uh, uh, shared the screen i uh, know it's up to you. are you sharing the screen because we haven't seen any uh screen shared yet uh okay okay so uh, yes now to an uh 30 seconds re um, remaining <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay all right okay i will kind of speed up and i will try my best all right, so but probably all of that subconsciously get into my, my brain and it was stored and then it gradually affected my, probably like my ability in, in, in writing and then my understanding towards various uh, reading texts and then of course gradually uh, affected my daily vernacular. So from uh, uh, finding how a word is, is being written and then finding how it is being pronounced into finding the meaning of it. When that full cycle happens, it feels, I, I always find it like um, amazing and, and exciting and also uh, satisfying. So just to imagine that getting all of those from having fun, just like uh, the previous speakers mentioned before, to, to, read, to read and to listen to what you like, to write, to, uh, and in, in your own pace, in your own time, and in your for your own enjoyment, I think that's amazing. So I guess if I had to give any insight or anything, it would be go start having fun. And then, yeah, these are my responses. So as I mentioned before, I, I love to, I find writing down my thoughts and what's on my chest therapeutic. So this is my genetic journal. It's like the archive of my thought, of my thoughts in uh, creative productions. And also this is my blog. Uh, channel being almost if, it, if you would like to check that out that would be amazing all right and this is uh, one of the example of the pieces um that i write so uh this is my in my review on this book and yeah basically that would be all so thank you so much for listening to me rambling and um, yeah thank you so much for the time so miss Addis, i would Okay. Give it back yeah. to you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I thought you didn't, uh, you didn't, uh, you know, intend to share any screen. That's why I kept, you know, letting you just ramble. 
Oh, oh okay. But yeah, yeah, but apparently you actually yeah. did screen share, but uh, and then it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't well, shown. It wasn't shared, oh. but, uh, yeah. but that's okay. okay. But what you told us was also very interesting, and yeah. Oh, oh God. Um, today's uh, webinar is amazing. All speakers are were sharing their thoughts well, and then so, and you know the question, the audience uh, is very enthusiastic in as asking questions. But again, uh, um, you know, the time limits us to, you know, to share uh, things even more personally. I mean, uh, to have a, a question and answers answered by the, by, the, by the speakers. But hopefully the, the function of chat box is there. Uh, so you can um, type the questions uh, both to our Telegram group as well, so that we can contact the speaker to answer your questions. And because it's already 12.15, um, sorry for the, the, you know, the extension of the time. Yeah, but... Um, Let's add a stay. Can, I, can yes. I just ask one question? Yes, Pavili. Uh, Ibu Sophie, are you still there? Ibu Sophie? Yes, Pa. Ibu Sophie? Yes. Yes, thank you so much for your very, very exciting and insightful presentation. I, I just have one question for you to address. Uh, I'm very interested in the module that you have, you have developed and uh, is now being rolled out. Uh, can I ask a question about how much time is needed for the students to finish one module? So that's point number one. Let's say, I'm just guessing, let's say that one module uh, requires about maybe 60 hours of student work. I'm just guessing, yeah, 60 hours. Yeah. Now, what I want to know is how much of that time is actually used for reading and how much time is allocated for the uh, many, many of the interesting reading activities. Now, this is a very important question to me because the whole idea behind developing uh, reading proficiency or reading competence is this principle that says children learn to read by reading and not by doing reading activities. So my question then is in the design of your module, do you expect students to spend a lot more time doing the actual reading or doing the many activities? I have nothing against the activities. Those are very exciting stuff. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our students actually do the actual reading, both in the classroom and also outside the classroom, because that is the most important uh, variable that contributes to the uh, overall literacy uh, development of the, uh, of the students. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Can I answer that, Ibu Adesti? Yes, Ibu Sophie. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you so much for the inter interesting question. Yes, it's it's very important but, uh, to to note that uh, the the highlight should be uh, on the reading itself and not on the follow up activities. And yeah, um, in in the module each week uh, there is one reading material designated only for um, independent reading mm. and not not followed by 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 anything. So mm. so the reading materials are, are leveled according to students' level. Um, and um, yeah, it's 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 designed for the whole day activity. So so mm. on on day five, uh, students are supposed to just answer the, the morning message and then read, mm. and they dedicate like the rest of the time or the mm. time allocation just for reading independently. Mm. So that hopefully answers. I know it's not enough, but yes, in, in uh, yeah, family, yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I think I think what we need to do is to bring the actual reading. Yes. Uh, for this to happen in the classroom. Uh, yeah. I think the other speaker also mentioned about the idea of, you know, drop everything and read, dear yeah, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That can be built in, yeah. in the curriculum, so that yeah. maybe every day, if possible, for yeah. maybe for 10 minutes or for 15 minutes, the students are actually doing reading, either reading alone or yeah. reading together. I think yeah. that is something that we need to remember because eventually what contributes to reading development or literacy development is the actual reading yes. that the kids do. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, just want to say something about Amalia. Amalia, are you are you still there? Risky Amalia. Yes, Baba, yes. I'm here. Yes, yes. As as you were presenting, actually, Dr. Jacobs uh, sent me a message. You know, giving okay. you a nice comment. <laughs> I would like to know uh, yes. what it was. <laughs> yes, I, I think what happened was this, you know, in 10 minutes, you were explaining the whole process of language acquisition, something which has taken researchers more than 30 years to figure out. I think that's, that's what Dr. Jacob is trying to say. Thank you so much for the kind words and thank yeah. you so much for delivering that great comments to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs. I hope, I hope really. I'm not misrepresenting you, George. No, uh, you know, we we're talking about extensive reading, but extensive listening is oh, wow. good. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Oh, well done. Thank you. Thank you all. See, Mama, you're doing a very good job. <laughs> Thank you, Miss. Thank you so yeah. much. Okay, uh, I think uh, that would be the end of our sessions. I would like to re return to Pak Bakti as uh, the master of ceremony. Uh, Pak Bakti, even though your video is not working, can you say something so we can hear your voice? To Ibu Adesi Komarasari. Yes, thank you so much. So the time is yours, Pak. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ibu Adesi Komarasari, as our moderator here. And also, it is a great opportunity to have these sessions with the honorable speakers, Bapak Eka Budiarta, Ibu Sofi, and then Dr. George. Thank you. And then also to our panelists, Ibu Sekar Ayu Adaning Room, and also Mamal, our alumna of Sabra University, and all participants who have contributed in today's workshop. And that is not all yet. We still have a remark from our head of English Language Education Study Program, Ibu Susulawati MA. Ibu Susi, the time is yours. Thank you, Pak Bakti. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our precious time flies like an arrow, uh, and we're getting to the closing time of our virtual uh, talk today. And uh, actually, we are uh, 15 minutes uh, above the, the time. Uh, on behalf of uh, English Language Education Study Program, Sampuna University, I'd like to thank a lot of people who, who have taken part in preparation of two uh, virtual talk series hosted by Sampuna University. I also like to thank Extensive Reading uh, Foundation, ERF, and Indonesian Extensive Reading Associations, ERA, for the opportunity to collaborate and host the Extensive Reading webinars. I wish to express my gratitude to speakers for sharing ideas and panelists who have shared experiences and best practices. I believe there are a lot of takeaways we got from the speakers. Also, thanks to the moderators who have led the discussion sessions. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Rector, Vice Rectors, Presidents of Sampuna University, who have joined and opened the talk. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your presence and support to this program. Most of all, I'd like to thank all participants. Thank you for the questions you delivered to the speakers and panelists. Uh, this will be a good insight for all of us. The talk will not stop here. The next uh, will be hosted by Maranatha University on September 5th at the same time, I believe. Uh, and our MC will inform about this as well. Have a great Saturday, everyone. I'll give the time back to our MC, Pak Bhakti. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Susi, our head of English Language Education Study Program. The 11th virtual talk is apparently the last virtual event hosted by Sampuna University again. Thank you to all committees, lecturers, and students for taking your time and dedication in arranging such a great event. Your action is much appreciated. So keep up with the next virtual talk, which is the 12th series, which is going to be hosted by Maranatha Christian University. Badian, please share the screen of our 12th, 11th, uh, sorry, 12th virtual talk. Yeah, we'll have a slide of information regarding this event upcoming next month. Yeah. The second one. Yes, um, this is the picture of Maranatha University campus at Ban in Bandung, and it will be held on September the 5th, 2020. 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Jakarta uh, time. That is the information. Thank you, Badian. And uh, 
please don't leave here for the participants. Before you leave, don't forget to fill out the exit form, which will be provided in the chat box and also in the slide. Yes. GG.GG slash exit ticket underscore VT11, VT11. You can capture the slide as well. And that's not all. We still have a virtual group picture. To all participants, please turn on your video because we are going to capture your faces as well. But Dian will help us to capture this moment. Yeah, but Dian, please, uh, you, can, you can set up our screens to get a good picture. <laughs> I will start taking pictures. <clears throat> Get ready. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, the other one. Okay, just hold hold on. Don't go there yet. Itu ada Mbak Vera. Halo Mbak Vera. Oh iya Bu Vera, our lecturer Pak is still here. Mbak Vera can give a closing speech or something. <laughs> okay, Mbak Dian, how is it? Yeah, the okay, is one more picture. You've been blocked. <laughs> Blame it on Adesti. Okay. Okay. Adesti is blocking you. <laughs> That's all, Badian. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Badian, for helping, uh, for, for taking group picture. Well, that's wrapping up our event. On behalf of Sampurna University, thank you to all speakers and participants for making time to join us. Today, also, we would like to thank to Indonesian Extensive Reading Association and also Extensive Reading Foundation for your tremendous support. And it has been our pleasure to host this event for the second time. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event on September 5th at Maranatha University, Bandung. One beautiful quote from us is from George R. R. Martin, a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Have a great Thank weekend. You, Thank, Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Paul Willy. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bu Mama, thank you. Thank you.